Welcome to the Dom Sub Devotion Podcast. Every episode of Dom Sub Devotion is an authentic reflection of our real life in a loving 24 7 DS marriage. If you crave the passion and intensity of a power exchange dynamic inside of a deeply loving and intimate relationship, you found the right place. You can always find more from us in the show notes and at infinitedevotion.com. Thank you for listening. It really is an honor and kind of humbling in a way how much people want to know about us and our lives and our relationship and our marriage and our dom sub dynamic. And we get so many questions that we end up doing these question and answer kind of podcasts quite a bit. I love them. I do too, because we get in really deep into some stuff in the conversations between you and I, and the questions people send us show us not only what people want to hear from us, but also give us ideas of things that we can start to take apart and go even more into in future episodes. Yeah. So if you have questions for us out there, if you're a watcher, if you're a listener, please send them in to us. You can send them in through the contact page on infinitedevotion.com or any of our social media comments on this YouTube video. We'd love to hear them always. Absolutely. So today I've got a long list of questions that people have sent in since our last Q&A. Okay. And I'm going to start with this one. On a recent episode, we talked about permanence in our relationship. We did. And this question is, how does committing permanently not become self-abandonment? Great question. It is a really good question. And my first answer to that is, to some extent, making a permanent commitment to live in union with another human being is abandonment of a certain part of yourself. It's abandonment of your individuality and in choosing to ex to coexist and depend on another person in that union. You don't just get to be all of your independent self and have a commitment that makes so much more available. Yeah. What would you add to that? Well, for me, it has required abandonment of my own, my own identity as an ego in pursuit of truth through my submission and commitment to you and trusting. And so the only self I knew before was my ego self. And that's a very natural way to live in the world. Like there's nothing wrong with it. It just is right. And so I have actually come to find myself, my true self, my soul self through this union together. And I believe that's what's possible in this. And so it, you really have to pick apart the word self, like how are we seeing this word to actually uncover what that is for you? Yeah, because you can only go so far alone. Yeah. I think there's a quote that goes something like to alone we go fast but together we go far. Hmm, I like that one. And sure by being alone by ditching a relationship when it gets hard or staying single you can go faster to to whatever authenticity feels like to you. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing that without being seen and witnessed by another soul, and in this union of polarity between masculine and feminine, there are still going to be all sorts of things about yourself that you never, ever got to see. Yeah. And you can coexist in a relationship as two individuals and stay there. But we've gotten to experience a life individually and together because of our deep commitment in pursuit of the authentic self. 
The next question. What does physical appearance have to do with being dominant and submissive, and why do you emphasize this? I like that question too. <laughs> I'll let you go first on this one. Hmm. Well, the first word, maybe that was in it. No, it wasn't. Now that I just looked at the question is attraction, right? So we all are attracted to beauty. I experience beauty as an aliveness feeling in my body. And so for me, beauty is a lot of different things now when I've actually been able to tap into that. And so I like to put myself together in a way that I feel good and I feel alive and that accentuates me and my features for myself, but also for you, because I want to give you beauty. I want you to appreciate and like what you see and be physically attracted to me. Oh, I am. <laughs> and I want that from you too. Like I want to feel desire and attraction for you. And that's not superficial. Like I had to work through that in all of my process. Right. Judgment around wanting physical attractiveness. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't want to be in a relationship where it's like, it's good enough. Or like you said yes to me. So now you just get me however I want to be and however I want to show up. Like that doesn't make me desire you. Another piece to this question that I think is where the person who asked this was coming from with it is getting at how I talk to dominant men about the importance of things like grooming and dress and looking good, smelling good, take, mm. taking good care of yourself. Yum. <laughs> it is a... If you can't tell, we're doing this podcast during ovulation time for Dawn. <laughs> she is in full silly mode. Probably lots more laughing than tears in this one. The way that we take care of ourselves as men shows outwardly how we feel about ourselves inwardly. It's an external expression of our internal state. If we're sloppy with our presentation, it's showing something about how we feel about ourselves inside. And so we are always trying to be congruent in the way that I teach dominance is that the inner and the outer state need to be aligned. And if we are working on and growing in strength inside of us, we care about ourselves. We respect ourselves. We take care of ourselves. We take responsibility for life that needs to reflect itself in your actions and in things like how you groom yourself, how you dress yourself, how you take care of yourself physically. They are one in the same if we are trying to live congruent lives. And so it's not about, oh, you have to look hot in order to get a submissive. No, it's if you are caring about yourself and taking care of yourself, you're going to do everything you can to look your best. And that matters. Yes. And if you're only listening to this podcast, I've been nodding my head the whole time. Like, <laughs> yes, that's how I feel too, it, you know, as a woman. Absolutely. Next question is one for you. It asks, is Dawn submissive in other parts of her life outside of her submission to Andrew? Another great question. The way that I I was going to say feel about this is that I am your submissive. I am not a submissive. So no, I am not submissive to just anyone, anything, anywhere in a performative way of approaching anything. It's through my submission to you, through becoming more of who I am, that I've connected with a strength, a confidence, assertiveness that allows me to stand up and be me in a 
in a way that I didn't even know was possible, but I only kind of secretively hoped that I could actually be that before. And now I can live that. So I say like, I am your submissive. I submit to you. I remember telling you this at the very beginning of our dynamic that through this, you were going to actually become less submissive in a lot of areas of your life because you have always been somewhat of a natural follower, but that showed up in a lot of places as what maybe some people would consider submissive, but what was really people pleasing and self abandonment and through the process of learning to let go of control here inside of a safe space. I told you that you would become less submissive in all of the other parts of your life. And that is most certainly borne itself out to be true. Yeah. I remember that conversation conversations, I should say, because we had a lot of those at the beginning. And if anyone knows that you are my submissive and they see that you wear a collar and they understand what that means. And then they come to you with some assumptions about what it means about you in relation to them in any sort of conversation or context. I've seen you have a very solid fuck. No, don't you dare. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And all that to say, you are still a very willing follower mm -hmm. for someone in any part of your life when leadership is being offered in a way that is solid and embodied and true. Yep. And that is what I feel in response to whoever, whatever the situation is. And it's where I use my discernment on what is for me and what is not. Next question is, does Andrew allow Dawn to drive or is that submitting her safety to other drivers? And if so, under what circumstances? <laughs> so yes, yes, I, I do drive. I do allow Dawn to drive and no, she doesn't even need my permission to drive. Now, when we are going places together, I basically always drive. Yeah unless I ask you to, for some reason, maybe I need to do something or I'm not feeling well, whatever, then I'll ask you to drive. So when we're together, generally I open car doors for you, you ride along, you play DJ and I'm the one doing the driving and you're the one relaxing, keeping me company and putting on way more country music than I would have ever allowed in the past. <laughs> But that being said, yes, you still drive. You still go places without me. I don't see if I'm driving, I don't see that as me submitting to other drivers. They're not in charge of me. Can they crash their car into me? Absolutely. But that's not me submitting to them, but I don't see it that way. Yeah. And not knowing the energy behind this question, another thing I want to address, not necessarily to the person who wrote it, because I don't know this, but submission, dominance and submission doesn't mean micromanagement. No. It doesn't mean that I have to be in control of every action you take and trying to perfectly execute on some strategy of I'm always in charge and you're never in charge. Let's be real. You can't actually be in control in charge of every single thing in the world. You like, that's not right. how it works. Right. So yes, I do allow Dawn to drive and no, she doesn't even need permission. I don't drive as often at all. And no, I haven't forgotten how to drive yet. <laughs> well, our lives, we do this for a living. Yeah. We work from home. We live at home. Most of our going out, we go out together. So it's really when you aren't commuting to a job, your going places alone is generally social. Mm -hmm. 
and that kind of waxes and wanes depending on all sorts of different things. So yeah. Next question. Does Dawn instruct Andrew how to reach her when she's in a turbulent or resistant headspace? So like, do I outside being outside of that headspace? Do I tell you how to get to me in those? Right. No, because if you're wrapped up in your ego, there isn't always a way to get through to a person. <laughs> that being said, along the way, I have come to see myself and be able to wit witness myself in those things. And so I guess there have been a few times where I think I probably have said like, if I need you to just like call me out on this. If you see this, I don't want to be in this. I'm telling you that please call me out on it. I think I've done something like that, but it has required me being able to see it for what it is to some degree. So I guess I said no, but I also said yes to that answer. And the way that I see this is when you're in a turbulent headspace, it's not my job to reach you. It's my job to accept you in that. Because if you're in a, if you're in a triggered state of some kind, you are in an internal reaction to something that happened, which is really brought up pain inside of you or fear inside of you from the past. And you were living in that fear, that pain as though it's present right now. Right. And I cannot talk to you about your pain when I'm talking to your pain. I can't talk to you about your fear when you are living the fear. Right. You are actually in that fear. The only thing I can do is love you and accept you and hold you and be there for you. And then this is where I tell guys, by the way, use the next week strategy in your head. I don't mean actually wait a week to say the things you want to say to her, but tell yourself in the moment, I'll talk to her about this. I'm just going to do it next week. Give yourself some space in your head. So you're not trying to jump into fixing mode when she's in a triggered state. Just wait. Maybe you don't even need to say anything. Maybe this just needs to get felt and it goes away and saying something or jumping in would actually make it worse. Yeah. The other piece of that, that I want to touch on is that it is not a submissive's job to tell a dominant how to lead her. Very true. Because that's just saying that I want to not be in charge by telling you how to be in charge, which is you really just still being in charge and having me act out your preferred way of me being dominant. And that's not it. That honestly would feel gross. Like that's not supportive of me actually letting go of control, which is what I need to do. Yeah. And I need to step into being able to lead you which means doing it in the way that I see best, not in the way that you think I need to reach you. Yeah, this is where we have to surrender to the leadership that you provide. Well, I have to. <laughs> so this next question is one that I love, and we're probably going to spend a little bit of time on it. It came from one of our YouTube followers and the question was, is there a place for a dom to manipulate their submissive if it benefits their submissive's growth until they can see it for themselves? Great question. And it is, it, it's a challenging question because there have been times when I've needed to lead you towards things that you couldn't see for yourself. And I've needed to be able to see things that you couldn't yet see. 
and to help show them to you before you knew to look for them. And so is that manipulation or is that leadership? Exactly. I see it as leadership. The way I feel manipulation is more like a covert contract. It's, it's the energy behind it, underneath it. Yeah. Is it coming from a place of neediness in, on the dominance part, trying to manipulate you into getting something for myself? Or is it trying to lead you towards something that's better for you? Because I know that it's better for you, not because I want something out of it. That's the difference. Yeah. And I don't, the way you've approached any of how you've done this, I haven't felt manipulated at all. Even when you can see where I need to go and I can't, like that's not manipulation by my definition. Yeah. Cause there have been all kinds of times when I've led you towards a new experience, towards a new opening in yourself or seeing parts of yourself where every part of you wanted to tell me that I was wrong and that this wasn't it and that you needed to get away from whatever this was. Thankfully, I've learned that when I feel those intense flare ups and fear, that it is ego. And there is always something in it for me. Even if you would be wrong, just that flare up <laughs> is telling something yeah. for me. Yeah. And really, this is where I've learned to see those flare ups as showing me most of the time when I'm on the right path, because you wouldn't be resisting intensely something that was just like a, nah, not really for me. But if I see something as being true about you and then I expose you to it in a conversation, you know, whatever way that I try to point you towards it or lead you towards it, and you have a big gigantic reaction to it. <laughs> oh, we wouldn't be so defensive of this if it wasn't something that we were afraid of. Oh, I so hated swallowing my pride on some of those. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to. <laughs> So is there a place for manipulation in the way we're talking about it here? No, never, because it's un manipulation implies unspoken desires. And as you said, covert means to get things without having to talk about them, without having to go through the hard conversations, it's forcefulness and it violates consent leadership towards a better experience of life for your submissive from a place of pure care and love is necessary, but that's not manipulation. Right. Next question. Do you think this sort of dynamic can be built with anyone or does it take a certain vibe with a person to have that foundation? Well, it's kind of a confusing question because for one, you both have to have an interest in it. And the way we approach this, you have to desire authenticity. So when you desire to become more of who you are, I would like to say you can do this with anyone. I guess I can't say 100%. I would say that any two people who have chemist enough chemistry to want to be in a relationship with each other and who have some sort of desire for this kind of dynamic can make it work. If they're willing to swallow their pride, if they're willing to be wrong sometimes, if they're willing to learn the hard way, and to stick it out through the challenges because it's going to be hard unwinding all of your own patterns in the presence of another person. Yeah. But if you have two people who care about each other, who love each other and who want to be in this together, 
I think any of them can make it work. And really the only way that it fails is when people give up on themselves and give up on their partner and don't have the patience and compassion for themselves and their partner to give it the time it needs to unwind the old patterns to make new ones. Yeah. You have to be able to uh, stand in the face of being confronted. The next question is if a man is responsible for the relationship and safety, what are your thoughts on if the female partner cheats? Is that his fault? And again, there's all sorts of things behind this question that we don't know, mm -hmm. but taking it at its face, the first thing that I see in that question is the word fault. Mm -hmm. Responsibility. The question says, if a man is responsible for the relationship, responsibility doesn't have fault. It's not like he made, he did something wrong, therefore she cheated. Right. And back to the last question asking about, you know, can this work between any two people? Yes, it can. One of the things you're going to have to overcome is fault and blame and finger pointing and trying to make the other person wrong. And being a victim. And being a victim. And... Also, both people are going to make big mistakes. Yep. And if you have the, the depth and solidity of commitment, is it his fault that she cheated? No, it's nobody's fault. It's just the thing that happened. Can you have enough compassion to consider why it is that this happened and what can we do to make sure that everyone is getting their needs met and do it together. Can you even come through something like that with patience and compassion and a willingness to recognize that both people play a part in every single thing that happens? Yes, the man's responsible, but that doesn't mean everything that goes wrong, he's to blame. Right. The the story or an imaginative <laughs> laugh at myself sometimes i was imagining like asking permission to go get the mail and falling down the steps or hurting my ankle are you responsible for my ankle getting hurt is it my fault Right. Is it your fault? Am I to blame because so, I sent you to get the mail. Right. So, or is it just something that happened? Yeah, it's just something that happened. Now, the way I see you taking responsibility is helping me, getting me the care I need, and anything else that that involves. That's taking responsibility for me hurting my ankle. Yeah. We get too far in the weeds when we start trying to tear apart, apart every little situation and look at who's the one to blame. Yeah. We've got to get rid of the whole concept of blame. We have to get rid of the whole concept of fault and start looking at it through the lens of responsibility, which means if the female partner cheats, both people bear some responsibility in that because to some extent there's something in that relationship that's not working right. And both people are in some way or another have some responsibility for that. But the only way to ever get through something like that or pass something like that is for both people to take ownership of that, not pointing fingers and figuring out who's the one that was wrong. Absolutely. Next question. What are some examples of how to remind a submissive of her place when she's resisting? <laughs> I'll answer this one because <laughs> this would be the exact thing we talked about earlier, where that's what the dominant needs to be able to know and understand and see. And the first thing I'll say to this is 
you have to know you're submissive. There are no one size fits all approaches to this. You have to know the human. This is why love matters. This is why, even if you're not in love, you can have a dominant submissive dynamic without being in a lifelong commitment relationship like we are. But there needs to be some love and care present for that other person. Because if the submissive is resisting and you go to the list of things that you found on FetLife that says, here's how to <laughs> put a submissive in her place when she's resisting. And you pick number six and number six is beat her. Like, no, you got to know the person you have to under what is being resisted. Why? What's underneath that? Is there fear there? Is like, is she afraid of something or is she pushing back against something? Is she resisting because what I'm asking of her is actually coming from a needy place inside of myself. So why would she follow that without resistance? Because she shouldn't, she should say no. So the first thing to do as a dominant, if your submissive is resisting is to look inward at what is going on in here first and what's going on in her. And then while well, you reinforce what it is that you were asking and why, and if that is coming from a, a pure place, just a firm statement of fact of this is what I expect of you. And here's a reminder of why are we clear should be more than enough. Yeah. When I hear that question of like, remind her of her place. What's her place? Like, are we speaking of like, you're less than me energy? I'm greater than you energy of, are we speaking to like, you need to obey me or else? You know, there's just, there's a weird twinge maybe to that. I don't know. Cause, but if there is, uh, that doesn't feel good to me. Right. The way we approach this is we are equal, but opposite. Right. Dominant and submissive are equal, but opposite. So it doesn't mean that we are seeking equality. Nope. It doesn't mean we're seeking sameness. We're actually seeking to be extraordinarily different from each other. Opposite. Opposite. And to live in that opposite nature. But if there is a, well, let's say this in a scene, there can be some really hot, sexy energy using things like degradation play, using things like force and ways we might play in the bedroom. All consensually. Consensually. Absolutely. But bringing those kinky turn-ons into trying to get you to live your entire life. And like, I, if I were to expect you to be as turned on by something outside the bedroom in a non-sexual piece of our relationship, as you might be inside, I'm just fucking delusional. Yeah. Because we're still, we're human beings. We don't, erase our humanity just because we are in a dominant submissive dynamic. Right. Next question. Does Dawn wear her collar to sleep? Do you wear your collar to sleep? I sure do. I always wear it. Wore it today when you were getting your hair done. Yep. And we have fun conversations. <laughs> The first time I went there, like getting my hair washed, she notices the metal collar. <laughs> She's like, would you like to take that off? <laughs> when you put your head back on the hard uh, sink, and I'm like, nope, it never comes off. And so that opens up lots of questions. So it's it's been a fun relationship to develop there. Yeah, she's very fun and open and You've had lots of fun conversations with her. Yeah, absolutely. 
So, yes, she wears it to sleep. Also wears it in the sun and gets a nice little collar tan line, which I think is sexy. Yeah, in the sauna, in the shower, all the time. Next question is, how do I submit to my partner when he's not fully in his dominance? I'm working on my submission, but I just can't do it for him. All I want to do is push back and be defiant. I want to submit, but I find it difficult to see him as someone I want to give my submission to. Oh, I can understand that last statement. <laughs> because I couldn't submit to you without you being solid in your strength. Now in saying that, you weren't you weren't where you are today, where you were a year ago or two years ago or three years ago. Neither was I. Right? But I'm gonna let you take that one a little bit deeper because our dynamic started with you leading me. This is the the two way street. This isn't just the dominant has to have it all together and perfect, and then the submissive will completely let go of all control. No. This is a step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step process. And what we've found is that as I've gotten stronger, you have automatically let go more, piece by piece by piece. We don't have to figure that out, and we're not keeping score, but it just keeps getting easier. It keeps getting more natural feeling for us. Yeah. The farther that we've gone. And so anything where I would be trying to force myself to be more dominant because I want you to be more submissive is faking it. And it's not authentic. It's not real. It's not congruent. There are no fucking shortcuts to this. No. But also... In this situation, the way I'm reading this question, you also have to allow that dominant to come into dominance in the way that it's real and true for him and follow him as he is. I just said before, you have to know you're submissive if you're going to be leading her, putting her in her place or calling her out. If you're a submissive and you want to submit to a dominant, you have to submit to that human being as they are, not try to get them to do it the way that you want them to. Because then you are wanting to be a submissive, but you're actually being a dominant. Yep, the good old topping from the bottom. And that will never allow a submissive to open. No, and it'll never allow a dominant to actually feel solid and strong in himself because he's just performing. He's a dancing monkey yep. for her fantasy. Absolutely. And then that won't feel good to her because she'll know he's faking it because he is. Right. And this is all why the emotional work is necessary. Yep. And doing that little by little, piece by piece, a little bit at a time. Together. Together. There's a another quote that... If we don't grow together, we grow apart. But if you look at that quote, it also implies that if we do grow together, then we're not growing apart. Mm -hmm. So when we do this work together and we grow alongside of each other, we may realize that we are different in ways that we thought we were the same, but we've come into that higher, more embodied, more true version of ourselves in in this relationship and being witnessed by each other being celebrated by each other being having it welcomed and encouraged by this person and now it gets to feel good to be there with the person who loved you through it and that's incredible right it's far far better than just ditching someone because you think you're not the same mm-hmm could you discuss how you grew up? What was life like before meeting each other? So for me, I grew up in the country. We're both farm, farm kids from Minnesota. 
and most of my upbringing was on a, a little like hobby farm out in the country. So in general, lots of time alone in the eighties when there wasn't technology, there wasn't computers, cell phones, smartphones, and living out in the country, there was not much of anything to do. You had to entertain yourself. And so for me as a kid, I spent a lot of time doing things like walking in the woods, climbing trees, building forts in trees, hanging out, out in the woods by myself. And then I lived in that house all the way till I graduated high school. I went to college, started as a music major, finished as a business major. I've talked about that on a recent podcast too. And then started a couple of different businesses. The second of which was when I hired Don as one of my first employees when I opened. Good choice. Great choice. <laughs> but yeah, there, there, I, there, I could talk for a long time about my whole life before having met you, but there's a little synopsis at least. How about you? Well, I grew up on a farm and spent a lot of time outside. I can't say I feel like I remember a lot about my childhood, but I can think about plenty of different moments. I grew up kind of in the church, in the Lutheran Missouri Synod. Went to a private school from preschool all the way through high school. So small. I had eight kids in my class a couple extra in kindergarten, but kindergarten through eighth grade, two grades to a classroom. So like my circle of friends was like in my grade, there were five of us girls. And so we had a class below and then a class above and I alternated every other, but like just limited, I guess, in like even social circle. Yeah. Very sheltered. Yeah. Very sheltered. And yeah. so. And on my side of that, even though I was in a smaller town, I went to a school that had about in my high school, about 400 kids in my grade. So I did grow up around a lot more people and not heavily sheltered in a religion. Yeah, that was me. And so it was like church every Sunday, Sunday school, and then school Monday through Friday and um, living out in the country, there were n not really any neighbor kids. Eventually, I started playing with a couple that were younger than me. Maybe the boy was maybe my age, but like, especially over the summers, my social interactions were not much. So I spent my time playing Barbie dolls, riding my bike, playing in the sandbox. I had a tire swing for a while and um, playing with my dollies. I don't remember a lot of interactions with my sisters. I was the baby. I was the youngest. I am the youngest, I should say. Shocking. Yeah. So I was into music. I played piano from third grade on. And then in high school, I also added, well, elementary school, I added clarinet and then tenor saxophone for jazz band. And so I was yeah, into music. I still love music. I don't play. I can play the piano. Shockingly, some of that just never goes away. Not as good as I was before, but like if I practiced, it, it's there. It's just in me, mm -hmm. you know? And I got a job in high school as a server. And so I did many years of serving and then bartending and had kids at a young age. And my life led me to you. When you hired me. So good decision. Absolutely. It was, <laughs> sure. I, I still remember. Well, I still remember a little bit of the interview, but just needing to decide, like, am I going to take this job? Am I not? And you were like needing me and wanting me and I had had insurance background. So I knew I was a good candidate. 
Well, let's tell that story just briefly because I don't think we've told it before. <laughs> we haven't. So when I when I officially met Don, we jokingly say that we met on Craigslist <laughs> because I I put the job ad on Craigslist that she responded to that eventually ended up with me interviewing her. Craigslist back then is was very different than it is now. <laughs> Let's put that disclaimer. Yeah, I haven't even looked at Craigslist <laughs> for 10 years. I don't know what it's like now. What's it like now? Well, just from what I hear people say, because oh, we oh, have oh. shared that story and they're like, Craigslist? And it sounds like this like scary place. Well, no, it was actually a place where you looked for housing and like yeah, it jobs was, and... It was classified, online classified ads. Yeah, yeah. So you came to this interview and... I was starting a business. I needed a couple people to work in the support roles when I opened, which means, which meant I needed to train people before we opened. Yeah. And it was about six weeks until my opening day. And this woman walks in interviewing for this job and was exactly what I was looking for in a candidate at that point. And so I offered her the job on the spot in the first interview. Yep. And that was our first meeting. Mm -hmm. And then it was a year and a half or a little bit more later that we actually had sparks fly between us and things actually took off and became what they are. So now. random, yeah. but clearly by design for us. Next question, what were your higher education goals and career dreams, and are you living them out? Well, mine's kind of simple, so I'm just going to share first. Okay. <laughs> My whole childhood, I just shared how sheltered I was. I did not grow up around women who sought after careers. I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be a kindergarten teacher. And... I, full transparency here, started college for that. And in the first semester of college, I ended up pregnant and finished the semester, quit, did some courses to understand how to do some, you know, Microsoft Office stuff. And at the time then got my first job in insurance. And so I gave up any pursuit of a job in what I thought I wanted because I was becoming a mom. And I, that was my emphasis. That was, she, I knew I was having a girl and she came first. So I don't regret any of that. I've always had this desire to help other people. And that's what I get to do now for real in an authentic me being me all the way. So I wanted, love how it all happened. And you wanted to be a teacher and now you teach people. Yeah. I by mean, just being yourself and sharing your experience. Right. So. So mine's a little more complicated and to not go terribly deep into this. I've mentioned before that I was also very much in music, especially in high school. And I had offers full scholarship offers to two of the best music schools in the United States as a vocal performance major that I turned down because at the time being a farm kid in central Minnesota, I just couldn't see myself moving to the big cities that these colleges would have required me to move to and ended up going to a smaller school closer to home, four hours away, that also had a very world-renowned music program and started there as a mu music major and ditched that for business in my first year. So at that point, my higher education goals and career goals and dreams all became about money and they all became about the pursuit of financial abundance and wealth. So if I'm going all the way to what my real goals were and what my real dreams were. No, I'm not living them. And I also 
burned myself completely out in the pursuit of what wasn't real and what my real goals weren't, but what I went chasing after, because what I came to realize is that when you were running away from your authenticity towards something external that you think is going to fulfill you, it doesn't work. And so I'm not living the business, the successful business life in the way that I thought it would be. And I'm also not in music in the way that I thought that I would be. Does that mean I'm not fulfilled? No, I'm more fulfilled now than I've ever been in my life. But I, I shared that to say that just because you, things don't go the way you think that they're going to, doesn't mean that they're not working out because the way my life has worked out and turned out to be where I am doing what we are doing and living with the amount of freedom that we have is worth more to me than anything else. So don't get too attached to what you think your goals are because the truth will always be better. Absolutely. Next question says, does sir ever feel the need to let go and have a shoulder to lean on and not be the one to make a decision? And I would answer that one this way. Now, no, never. Because I want the responsibility. I want the self-ownership. I want to be in that role. And I can be in that role without feeling like I need someone else to lean on or opportunities to get away from the responsibility because of the inner strength that I've built, because of the emotional healing that I've done, because of the trauma healing work that I've done. And because I'm living a life where I don't have any secret compartments in here, there's nothing to be avoided. I feel like I'm living as truly congruent and authentic of a life as I can possibly live. And there's nothing to get away from. There's nothing to hide from. And taking responsibility isn't a burden from the place that I've been able to find now in my own life and in my own inner strength. I've heard you say it's a freedom. Absolutely. It's, it's the ultimate in freedom because real freedom exists in, in here, inside. Yeah. And when I'm not challenging your leadership, it feels freeing to you mm -hmm. to take the direction and lead both of us. Right. And that's why this thing we mentioned a little while ago, the step by step, piece by piece, bit by bit thing matters because you did challenge my leadership all the fucking time yep, in the I past. Sure did. But I was leading from a place where I wasn't as solid inside of myself. I hadn't done the work to heal myself. I hadn't done trauma healing work. I hadn't worked on my emotional reactivity. So you were right to challenge my leadership and to challenge my dominance in at those times because I wasn't bringing that dominance from a place of inner strength. And it was your challenging me that helped me see where I was bringing this from a place of inner weakness. And that helped me be stronger. That's so good. Yeah. Our whole experience of each other has only changed and felt more real and open as we both have continued to quote unquote, do this work. Yeah. And this is what I tell dominant men all the time when, whether I'm teaching them in one-on-one -on -one coaching or in my dominant men course, your woman, your submissive is not there to just bow down and never challenge you. You need her to challenge you. You need her to speak up. You need her to use her voice. You probably don't want it, but you need it. It's so fucking valuable to me when you challenge me, because if you challenge me and it shows me something about my inner state being messy somehow, then that gives me an opportunity 
to shore up the internal experience that I'm having and to bring it from a stronger place. Or if you challenge me and I look inside and I say, no, I'm good on this. Then it will sh Then I can also look at you and see where is this coming from? Is there fear? Is she afraid? Is there past pain that's coming up for her? Is there something in this challenging of me that is me? And is there something in it that's her? Because this is a part of how I lead you is I need to see you. I need to be able to witness you from a solid grounded place in myself so that I can see what's going on with you in ways you can't do that yourself. Cause you're, if you're on the inside of your own messy, turbulent inner emotional experience, you can't see yourself. You need, you need me to do that, but I have to be solid enough to do that. Yeah. And I'm guessing that might bring up an important question there, how that is different for men and women, but we can get into that on another podcast. We might be able to do a whole episode on that. Yeah. This one's a little fun. I've never actually brought a question like this into one of the Q and A's, but I want to for, for a reason here. Oh, okay. Any suggestions to please my partner who has a praise kink? And wants more praise while we are being intimate. I have two things on this, why I wanted to bring this question in here and answer it. First of all, praise is just a form of expression. And if we as the dominant are wanting to praise our submissive, it's not about knowing the right things to say. It's about expressing how you feel about her. If you want praise to feel good to her, notice what you're feeling about her and then say it out loud. Don't make it about the kink and saying the right words to satisfy the kink. Look at how you feel about her and then praise her for that. What do you appreciate about her? What are you grateful for? You want praise kink to hit deep, have it be really, really authentic praise of her and the, the woman and the person and the human being that she is. And deeper than actions. Right. Not just praise for doing a good job, praise for being good, being worthy. And How about this for praise kink? Like you are worthy of good things in your life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's different ways that you can take that and play with that in the kink realm, but pay attention to how her body responds based upon certain words, because what words work for me, different words are going to be the magical button <laughs> mm -hmm. for another woman. Yeah. Because we all have our own connotations, associations from our past. And, you know, we've heard women feel like the word submissive, they could never use that word. But if we dropped that word and we talked about what does it mean and what, what is the possibility and how can life look like, they might be like, I want that. And I'd be like, well, that's kind of the definition of a submissive. They're like, well, not in my mind, right? So... Yeah, you got to just play with play with the words. Yeah, you made a really good point there. And let's be real, praise kink is a thing over here. Yeah. The paying attention to how her body reacts and responds to different words is the key here, to different phrases, different things. All of the praise that I give to you needs to be authentic or it doesn't land. Nope. That's, and that's the other reason that I brought this question was because of the wording, any suggestions to please my partner. If you want to be pleasing to your partner, you don't do it for them. You do it. You praise them from a place of how you really feel about them. If you're focused on how to do what they want, what she wants, if you're trying to figure out what she wants and give it to her, you're putting her in control. 
So if you're doing this from a dominant place, you have to be expressing the truth of how you feel. So those words have to come from an authentic place inside of me for them to land with you. But then also, like you said, certain things are going to land differently than others. And it's paying attention to how your body responds to the things that I say to you, the things I growl in your ear, how your body responds, not what you think should turn you on, not what you think should excite you, but what actually does excite your body and make your body react, whether you think it should or shouldn't or does or doesn't or will or won't, but what actually makes your body react has shown me so much about who you really are as a person and as a submissive and as a being. Yeah. I want to speak just a little bit to the more about the actions because that's not nothing either when you have a praise kink. Like I love hearing that you appreciated how I served you and how I cleaned the house and did the laundry. I especially love when you love what I cook for you. Yep. That's what I, <laughs> I knew you were going there. There's so, no better way to put a smile on Dawn's face than for me to praise and express appreciation and gratitude for her cooking. Yes. And that's like expression of it's, it's energy moving it's expression. It's, it can be desire. Like it can be foreplay. Let's be real. Like having a meal together and hearing you say like, oh my gosh, this was so good. It's my favorite all week. Like whatever is real for you, I want to hear it and I want to feel it only when it's real. And of course you've never not said it when it's not real. My point in that is I can feel it. Like I feel the authenticity of what you're sharing and I feel what that does inside of me. Yeah. And this is where men can get really bound up in themselves and uncomfortable with expressing themselves in this way. You're just saying what's true. Yeah. And bringing a little bit of character and personality and energy to that is what's really important here. Because if you made so. Don makes sourdough pizzas, homemade sourdough pizzas for me every couple weeks. And if I said good pizza, that's true. It's good pizza, <laughs> but that's not going to land the same as if I look at you and presence here, guys, presence matters, like attention, attentiveness, looking her square in the eyes and saying, you know, I really, really love this pizza. And I appreciate all the time and the attention and the care that you put into making it. And I feel your love for me in this. It's going to land way different than good pizza. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So don't be afraid to express yourself. It's important. She needs to hear it. Whether she has a praise kink or not, you've got to share how you are receiving her. How sh her love is impacting you. Heck, it might show you her praise kink. <laughs> yeah, you might learn she has one if you start praising her. She might learn she has one. It's, I think to some degree it's alive in all of us. Absolutely. All right, I think we got time for one or two more here. I know from your podcasts that Andrew asked Dawn to be his submissive. My perspective, Dom thinks I should ask him, but it feels like that's putting me in charge. Wouldn't it be best if he asked me? <laughs> I ask. No, you ask. No, you ask. Should I ask? <laughs> How I would respond to this particular question is, if you both want to be in this, why are you so concerned about making, being right? you, this is the, the thing we were talking about earlier on in this podcast that you have to let go of all the finger pointing and the blaming and the fault. I hear in this question, like both of you are trying to make each other wrong by thinking that the other one, like, I know what's right and you're supposed to do it this way. How about admit the fact that it sounds like you both want to be in this dynamic together and you're getting hung up on who's asking the question. This is where 
couples that have been married for 20 years stop having sex because neither one of them wants to be the one to initiate sex. Yeah. If you both want to have it, how about we stop worrying about who says it first and keeping score and sit down together and say, we want to do this together. Let's do it together. Absolutely. I, all I hear is like, just make the commitment together. Like you're both wanting it. Yeah. No reason to argue about it. That sounds kind of silly. But thanks for the question. I would like my boyfriend to be more involved in our DS relationships. What steps should I follow as a submissive? Well, expression for sure. Express your desire for what you're seeking more of, what you're needing more of. And then allowing his, allowing him to step into it in his way. Again, if you are laying out all of the, the ground rules and the specifics of how this has to be, now he has to be a dancing monkey f for you and you've, you're the one in charge. All you can do is ask and share what you want. Yeah. We may have something coming out sometime that might be helpful. <laughs> Stay tuned for that. <laughs> Two more questions. You've mentioned consuming less information. What does Dawn consume to support her submission? There was a time and a place that I did consume some information. Got to a point where there was a very strong inner knowing that that time was up for me. And so I do not consume specific information around how to be a better submissive or how to do submission. All of this is about being authentic to myself, which comes from inside of me, along with following you in your leadership. And so my information consuming isn't really information. It's fun, sexy romance lots of fun stories. And I go in and out of that because the deeper I've come into who I am, the more I'm aware of all of the information from hearing things from other people to whatever you share with me is sometimes information. And so I've learned to really be present with my capacity. And sometimes that means I'm reading and books. And sometimes it means I be still. And I just sit in silence even. So you just sit around all day? Yeah. Just sit in the corner all day long. Just do absolutely nothing. <laughs> but I'm, I'm talking about information even to the level of music. I used to always think I needed music to work out, music on a walk or a podcast or something. But I really find enjoyment in silence inside of myself, stillness inside of myself. And I'm very in tune with my capacity to receive even in music. In support of your submission, you don't consume information. And I think this is the, one of the biggest problems that people have with being able to live this lifestyle or really any authentic life, by the way, dominance and submission in the way that we talk about it is a path to authenticity. You cannot find your way to authenticity in your head. You can't consume enough information to ever help you feel anything. You have to have experiences. You have to go live and make mistakes and f have things fall apart and collapse and put them back together and learn from the mess of life. Information won't ever get you there. So consuming information isn't the route to better and deeper submission. It's not the route to more authenticity. It's not the route to a better life. It'll only maybe give you enough information to show you where to go look, but then you got to go live yeah, and get out of the books and out of the social media and out of the podcasts and out of the distractions and go live your damn life. But 
I, I will say there's a time and a place for some of that stuff, but there's probably more over-consuming happening, which then leads for me, it led to incongruence in my body of like feeling this and hearing this. I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense with that. And then all of a sudden I'm in this like free state of like, I don't fucking know. And I'd always bring it to you and you're like, probably secretively saying in your head, even though you were indirectly leading me, this is back to the leadership manipulation question. This was one way where you did gently guide me, but I, um, away from overconsumption, you did share that, but I came to the point where I had to face head to head of this inner knowing, like be done. And there was no arguing with that and what it felt like in my system. Yeah, too much information, especially when you start getting all the conflicting messages, just puts, it'll put you right into your head, man or woman, it'll put you right into your head and trying to figure out, well, I've heard this and this and this, and I read this and I heard this and I saw this and they're all in conflict with each other. So now what do I do? You got to stop, you stop step away, go live your life and feel how it feels to live your life. You know, this embodiment word that is a buzzword, I think around, but there's value in it. Right. And so it's like, how do I live in my body? Let me consume information in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> like it's the very opposite, you know? So again, time and a place for some of it. I mean, let's be real. We're a form of information. We acknowledge that. Yeah. <laughs> but our goal is always when we're coaching people, when we're teaching people, we want to show you how to go be you mm -hmm. so you don't need us anymore. Absolutely. We aren't looking to create de people that are dependent on us. We want you to learn how to be yourself so you don't need to talk to us or listen to us anymore at all. I don't care if that means that our podcast never has... 10 million listeners. It's not going to. When people seek authenticity, they generally find their way away from a lot of other entanglements in their life because they're just out being themselves. Yep. Last question. How have you noticed submission changing for you at different points in your cycle? Hmm. I would say in the past, it definitely was affected by my inability to be present with my life experience as it was in full acceptance of where I was. And when I was a, more disconnected from my deeper sexuality. And so as I've come into more alignment there, more acceptance and love, I feel alive in a way, and I've touched aspects of what feels like pure submission inside of me that I didn't even know was possible. And so how that is displayed, like through expression of desire and how I'm showing up, sure, yes, I, my energy just is felt differently right now, like you said, I'm in ovulation. So I'm just like more giggly and more outgoing and just, it's just different. But the actual submission to you feels pure every day, without a doubt. I can't say that I felt that way in the past, but that's the point where I'm at now. And it didn't feel that way in the past. It wasn't that way in the past. It, it, it actually went for a long time where it felt like any ground we gained towards being more in this union, in this connection that we live in now, that it would happen in a period of about three or four days around ovulation out of a month. Yeah. And there was a point where I put a lot of pressure on myself to make the most out of ovulation time because it felt like the only time you were open to me. It felt like the only time that I could get through to you. Yeah. And 
then sometimes it would feel like we went farther backwards over the next 24 days before we got back to another four day window. So we were there at one point. Yep. But over time, it's just continued to get better. And that's why you need patience with each other. That's why you need to have compassion. And a big part of why that got better, by the way, wasn't you changing. It was me accepting the fact that this is a part of what makes you a woman and mirroring acceptance to you. There's that line in Jason Mraz's song where he said, says, I'm not attached to any way you're showing up. The woman I love is the name of the song. And when I really started to actually embody that, to not be attached to any way that you're showing up, you were able to start accepting yourself more in all of the different parts of your cycle, which allowed you to be open to me more than just when the hormones dictated it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in my unique experience of life, there was just a lot of garbage on top of things as well. And so as I've peeled back those layers and laid down the emotional garbage, like, this is just what is there. It's the joy, aliveness, and the expression of desire. And like, it's just ever flowing in a way that I didn't know what was wrong with me before. It was like, oh my gosh, I felt so into him yesterday. And today I don't like, what's wrong with me? And I wouldn't necessarily vocalize that or even really think about it too much to myself, but it was in the unconscious patterns feeling like, yeah, I was so sexual yesterday and now I have no libido. What's wrong with me? You know? Yeah. So thank you again to everyone for all of your questions and for everything you've sent into us. We want more of them. If you have other questions, if our answers to these questions generated questions for you, send them to us through social media, send them, put them on YouTube as comments or send them to us through the contact us page on our website. And we would love to hear from you about your feedback and thoughts on this episode. We appreciate you so much. And for all of you who are watchers and listeners, thank you. It means a lot to us. Yes. We love you all. Thank you so much.